can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Hey, welcome to another week of the choices we face. Every week we have choices to make, choices that we face, and we hope that the program today will help you to make good choices and face them with courage and confidence. Our guest today is Kevin Wells. And I'm not gonna tell you too much about Kevin, other than that, I find him inspiring. He's written several books and we're gonna talk about them. But anyway, Kevin, welcome. Ralph, it's wonderful to be here. Yeah, you know, it's great to have you. Uh, why don't we just start at the beginning? You tell us a little about your story. You know, you were born and then what happened? <laughs> well, I, I uh, family of 10, um, thank God, uh, all faithful Catholics today. I have well, a brother who's a priest. Yeah. Um, sort of a normal Catholic upbringing. Um, prayed the rosary as a family. Uh, parents really led their eight children um, uh, into the faith, I'd say, well. Um, where'd, you, where'd you grow up? Oh, I grew up, so I grew up uh, in Bowie, Maryland, which mm -hmm. is uh, outside of D.C., a suburb mm -hmm. of D.C., uh, sort of a normal Catholic upbringing, uh, with 16 years of Catholic schooling. Uh, ended up becoming a, uh, a journalist. I really like to write. Mm -hmm. So I ended up covering uh, Major League Baseball. I was a sports writer, a journalist yeah. for, uh, for 10 years. And um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, so that's sort of how I got started as a writer. Yeah, so from one of your books, that was down in Florida, is that right? You yes. You were a sports writer in Florida, yeah. I was the first uh, beat writer for the Tampa Bay Rays. Yeah, okay, good, very good. Now, um, have you always been like a dedicated Catholic? I know, you, you know you've grown up as one, but you've really like stepped forward, I think, in recent years, really proclaiming and preaching and, you know. Yeah, I think, Ralph, what, what happened with me, and I'll, and I'll try and be brief here, is I had just turned 40, and uh, I'd be going to the same retreat during Advent for years. Um, my family had been going since the 1950s. And I remember on this particular retreat, um, I was pretty fed up with just the, let's just call it a malaise or a sloth. I, I wasn't deep in any kind of mortal sin yeah. or grave sin, yeah. but I was tired of... It was almost like God, you're growing up now, and you're married, and you have three children, and 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 God expects more of you. So um, uh, one night, uh, the night before I left uh, to go home, it was around midnight. I was down on the banks of the Potomac River, and and I it had to be the Holy Spirit, um, but it convicted me to say. Um, I remember there was driving wind; these waves were slapping up against the dock, and and I said. Um, you know, God, you sent your son into the world to endure violence, to redeem all of humanity. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I need to be struck down. Um, I, I need to be awakened to the reality of your will for me. So, 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 so strike me down. God, make it violent. Wow. And um, yeah. It, well, it, that's a very brave prayer to pray. It, or stupid. <laughs> well, or inspired, really. It was, it was inspired because I had never had the thought before in yeah, my life. Yeah. A month later, almost to the exact second, I had a brain aneurysm. Oh. Um, so I was struck down. God kept his end of the bargain. Um, so a lot of, I, I should have died. Um, I had I had a failed invasive brain surgery. Um, blood was drowning my brain. Something, um, I would say, miraculous. And, and the two people, the priest and his assistant who were in the room when they prayed over me, asking for the intercession of my uncle, Monsignor Wells, um, happened in that room. And, and Ralph, I'm with you today, so I'm alive. Mm -hmm. uh, but after that, to answer your question in a roundabout way, everything changed. Uh, when I finally got back on my feet, it, it took a while to sort of walk and, and get it back together again. Um, I began to see that comfort was not part of the equation. Uh, the least comfortable person in the history of the world was Jesus Christ, the starved man on the cross, the poor man of Nazareth, who had no, no place to lay his head. And, 
And I said, if, if I'm comfortable as a husband or a dad or, or a proclaimer of, of my Catholic faith, then, then I'm no good. Um, so that's when I began to sort of see, look more interiorly about my own self. But also, Ralph, and I'll, I'll sort of wrap it up here, I began to see in a, in a, a way I didn't want to see, um, sort of month after month, year after year, that, that priests, priests seem to um, be comfortable behind the ambo contracepting the truth of the proclamation of the gospel, sort of being afraid to tread into certain places and, and other things. And I said, this doesn't make sense. Um, they're, they are Jesus Christ in persona Christi Captus. Why would they not want to um, live as Christ ontologically ask them to, 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 to sacrifice, to negate their worldly comforts? They are not, they are not uh, bachelors. They are, um, they are servants of the Lord. So that led to writing the book, The Priests We Need to Save the Church. Yeah, yeah. Now, when, when you mentioned about comfortable, I, I just remembered something. I think Archbishop Chaput said it, that the time of comfortable Catholicism is, is, is over and that comfortable Catholicism isn't going to be able to stand against the culture, you know, the culture that's coming against us, the hostility to Christ and the church, and that everybody's called to leave comfortable Catholicism and become a convinced Catholic. Uh, it, it, that's dead and gone. Uh, we see now um, that Christianity, Catholicism be, is being crushed by the world. There is no more standing on the wall. Um, I, I actually, Ralph, I see, I see to sort of see the world today uh, very simply. There's two sides uh, and there's a wall. Um, I think for too long there's been, uh, we'll just say Catholics, since uh, many Catholics will be watching this show um, a comfortable Catholicism where there's been helicoptering, where I want to go to the right side. I want to give myself fully and completely to the Lord. Um, I, I, I want to be bold. I don't want to go with the spirit of the age. I don't want to go with the zeitgeist, but it's just, I don't know how to do it. I think it's becoming clearer now to Christians, to Catholics, that they must choose a side. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, I believe you're right. Yeah, in a book I wrote, Church in Crisis, I have a chapter called Stop Straddling the Issue. And a lot of Catholics are kind of straddling the issue with one foot in the world, one foot in the church, and it's time to come to make the leap, isn't it? Well, tell, tell us about the book now on your Monsignor Wells, your uncle, and then how, how significant he was in your life. Thanks for asking, Ralph. I, so I grew up in the, in the shadow of, of a giant. Um, this is the book, The Priest We Need to Save the Church. So uh, where, where can I get it? I guess anywhere, Amazon. Uh, uh, Amazon, yeah. Sophia. Yeah. Um, yeah. I... Um, so pretty arrogant for a sports writer to write about a book about priests, how to be priests, but yeah. that wasn't it. It was, it was a really pleading, a thirsting for priests. Um, please tend to my soul. I, I want, I want to go to heaven selfishly. So I, I study the great priests, uh, saints, Vianney, Bosco, Neri, um, cause I can't write a book unless I know what the paragons did. And Monsignor Tom Wells, um, he was, he was a priest, my, my father's brother who shipped men into priests, into seminaries. He just had a magnanimity, uh, a joy, and a love for the Eucharist that was explosive. Uh, very, very uh, well-known in the D.C. area for 20, 27 years before he was murdered in his rectory in 2000. Um, what, 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 what about what was that? Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like to, 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 to speak of this, but he, he was the bishop at the time, Cardinal Hickey, a very good and holy bishop um, sent my uncle to that parish to break up what was really um, act of homosexuality in the rectory before him, uh, mm -hmm. the previous four priests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and a year later, my uncle is found dead. Mm -hmm. So we know Satan is real. We know the spiritual warfare, but Satan will kill. Mm -hmm. uh, my uncle was doing a lot of good. That's what um, Jesus says. He's a liar and a murderer. Uh, well, there you go. That's scripture. So it's scriptural. Yeah, That's scriptural. Yeah, yeah. So my my uncle is a casualty of of Satan's wrath, um, but but I had seen for twenty twenty five years what what a magnanimous priest does. Yeah. How he saves marriages. Um, how how he's unafraid to proclaim truth to my friends. Like my friend will qu would question him on something in the faith. I don't I don't believe this, Father. I believe that I can do a certain thing yeah. with a girl. And my uncle would say, well, that, that's fine, but you're on a path that's going to take you to hell. And <laughs> yeah. it, it just, there was no, there was no verbal straitjacket. Yeah. And, and what would happen, Ralph? He wasn't is, afraid to tell people the truth. Never. Because he really loved them. And, you know, I mean, to, 
to not tell people the truth when they're in danger of losing their soul is really not loving them. All about souls, all yeah. about souls, and also all about what did Christ want him to say? Yeah. Um, he was not gonna miss that moment. Yeah. And what would happen consistently is that person who he just told was on a path to hell, three weeks later, there's a knock on the rectory door. Father, mm -hmm. thanks for waking me up to the reality of my sin. Yeah. So, so anyway, I think that's what's got me into writing uh, books and articles about priests. Yeah. Now, I know also that you've become very involved with a tremendous ministry in Mexico that's really rescuing thousands of young people from trafficking and abuse and all kinds of other things. Tell us a little bit about that. It's the greatest thing going. It's um, So Venerable Aloysius Schwartz was an American, uh, he's on the path to, to sainthood, uh, an American uh, priest who is startling. He, he, he raised his hand in 1957 and asked to go to the worst place in the world. And at that point, it was post-war Korea. Uh, so that's where he started his priesthood. And within 15 years, this devastated land was, was sort of brought back to health. Boys' towns, girls' towns he built, hospitals, hospices, leprosoriums, tubercularians. So all these years later, Father Al, um, who I've been deeply inspired about, I, I wrote his biography, Priest and Beggar. Hey, hey, we have that too. Priest and Beggar, here it is. Uh, I haven't read it, but I've heard a lot about it. My wife's read it, her friends have read it, and they say it's just an absolutely amazing story about an amazing priest doing an amazing work. Ralph, I have to come on your program more often. Uh, <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, I mean, this is valuable stuff. We need to tell people about it. So tell us about it. So, so Ralph, so now what I do is, is um, Father Al has built um, a, a monument to the most bullied children in the world. Uh, in six different countries, there's 20,000 of the poorest of the poor, they're in these boys' towns and girls' towns who have been wounded in unspeakable ways. And he founded an order of sisters called the Sisters of Mary. And what these sisters do is they take these kids in for five years, starting usually at the age of 12, send them out at the age of 18, and they go into the world. And I believe this, Ralph, I believe they go into the world as some of the greatest Catholic missionaries that we have. Why? because for five years there's no earbuds, there's no video games, there's no music, there's no silliness. It is pure catechism, it is teaching, it is nuns who love them, who sort of get into the wound, take it out and say, now let the graces come in. So these kids, they graduate between three and 4,000 a year, go out into universities, workplaces, into their old villages as missionaries, full Catholic missionaries. I don't know who else is doing it and they have no fear. So if, if anyone, Ralph, I'll just throw this out there. If anyone is interested, please, to support these sisters, 20,000 kids. So there's 20,000 bowls of cornflakes were poured this morning for these children, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and grilled cheese. So they're in, they're in six different countries? Six different countries, yeah. yeah. Central America, South America, Africa, the Philippines. Yeah. Um, these are the future. These kids will be the future priests, nuns, and missionaries in America. And who are these nuns? Where, where do you get these nuns from? Ah, he started the order in Korea, post-war mm -hmm. Korea. That's when it started in 1964. So it's just built on. Today, there's 388 sisters, um, and, and there's not enough. There's too many yeah. children. Yeah. So so if, if your viewer goes to uh, worldvillages.org, worldvillages.org, to help these sisters, uh, it's the best thing going because they're producing. Not only are they saving the poorest of the poor, but they're sending them out as missionaries. I don't know what's better. Yeah, well, that's really amazing. Well. You know, after my wife and I saw the movie Sound of Freedom, you know, about trafficking, we kind of wanted you, we'd really like to do something to help to help people who are helping people being trafficked. And we got an email from a friend of ours in Florida saying, you really ought to consider donating to this organization, which is doing so good. So we, we decided to do that. So we will be doing that. I would encourage other people to do it too. I mean, it's really horrendous what's being done with children, really totally, totally horrendous. And it's so good what, what this organization is doing. Well, know? well, Ralph, I want to thank you and your wife for, for uh, donating. Um, I changed my tithe when I found out about them. I didn't know who they were three or four years ago. Now I do. So they're at the top of my tithe list. But yes, human trafficking is a big part of what the sisters do. They do go into the most dangerous villages in the world, two by two, they'll walk up mountains and they pass drug runners, MS-13, uh, traffickers, murderers. They have no fear though. Why do they have no fear? Because they're protected by Mary's mantle, Father Al's interceding, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. And they will go into villages, 10 or 12 houses, lean-tos, and, and they'll walk into rooms, essentially like 
lifting the lid of a coffin and looking down at, the, at a 12 year old girl and say, it's time to come down this mountain. And the poor girl or poor boy will say, well, mom, I, can, can, yeah, we've been praying for this moment. Mm. So, so that's what they do. And they'll take a 12 hour bus ride back to girls town or boys town. Mm -hmm. and so, so a lot of it is trafficking. So it, it's, these sisters are heroes because they don't care if they die. Mm -hmm. They're in the state of grace. We, we, you know, we, we, we believe in the, so, so if they die, they die, but what a way to go out. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, no, no better way to go than doing God's will, right? At, at, in God's time, which is totally under his control and under his providence. Now, besides the, the tremendous work you're doing encouraging holy priests, besides the tremendous work you're doing helping support and publicize what these great sisters are doing, helping children, uh, I, I've heard you speak now a few times at conferences, and I know that you're very concerned about what's going on in the world and the church, and you're you're speaking very clearly about that. Could you tell us a little bit about what you see happening, you know, in the church, in the world, and what you're encouraging people to do in this way of responding to it? Well, yeah, it's 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 deeply confusing to me uh, it, to speaking in, candidly, and I think it's time for candor in American Catholicism. Um, what's happening um, from Rome, from the Vatican? It it just it it, it troubles me. When I when I hear words like backwardism or rigidity, or or a question of even the creed or or, or certain, it, it just it, it's it's um, how do I say it? Troubling's too too light of a word. It's travailing. Um, so so I think during this time where it, there seems to be a reengineering or a purposeful desire to reengineer two thousand years of something radiant and transcendent and true, well let's soften it. Or let, mm -hmm. let's pick this part off, or let's re-engineer or change this. And and uh, uh, Ralph, I'll say that that's that's deplorable. It, it's it's it, it, it simply can't be done. Yeah. So so I think I think today it's it's simple as this: just proclaim the good news, um, untethered, um, and really, you know, I think it's it's a missionary zeal. As Father Al Schwartz had a missionary zeal. Um, it's it's not being it's it's accepting you're going to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So it's sitting in an airplane and talking to the person next to you who you sense or by he's what he's reading or she's reading to proclaim your faith. Mm -hmm. um, so as I guess what I'll say, Ralph, is as the forces even within the church seem to be coming against the truth, mm -hmm. um, we need to push back through Jesus Christ and begging the Holy Spirit. To give us the right words to say. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You know what? And you, and you kind of think like, don't we have our eyes open? Don't we see that major Protestant churches have tried this already? You know, that they've tried to say, hey, people will like us more if we de-emphasize our teaching on sexuality, or people will like us more if we kind of allow marriage and divorce, or people will like us more if we don't don't emphasize certain things. We don't talk about heaven or hell. We don't talk about repentance. We don't talk about sin. People are going to like us more. Just be just a nice positive picture. And every single church has done that has gone into radical decline. And and we have people, very prominent leaders in our own Catholic Church, saying, "Let's take that path. The world will like us more." You know, no, the world will mock us. The world will laugh at us for kind of imitating them and, you know, just sort of like going along with what they believe. Why be a Catholic if it's no different than the world? <laughs> Jesus Christ and the saints and the martyrs did not genuflect to the world. Yeah. They stood up to it. Yeah. They proclaimed the blazing furnace of the truth and yeah. they died. <clears throat> um, so so the fact that the church would want to genuflect to the zeitgeist, it makes it logically, it makes no sense. No, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's really crazy. So, so, it's so like, like the darkened mind is a veil over people's eyes. Don't you understand the gospel? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I don't need, think it needs to be over, over uh, emphasized, but, but without, um, without accepting all that the magisterium teaches, yeah. all that the gospels say, yeah. then just, just quit it because that's what the Catholic Church is. We must stand up for it. Yeah, that's what Jesus is calling every Catholic too. You know, sometimes it's a struggle to get there. Sometimes it's a struggle to completely understand. But if you want to understand what Jesus is asking and you want to do it as you understand it and you're sincere about that, the Lord will help you get there to, to where you need to be. Because he's not really calling for like a two levels of Catholicism. Here's a wishy-washy way of being a Catholic and here's a real way of being a disciple. No, there's only one thing he's asking. Come follow me. Abide with me. Let my word abide in you. Yeah. So, so I, you know, Ralph, the, the way in, in praying over these things, sort of where even our church seems to be leading us, I always come back to one thing. 
it seems to me that we have forgotten, many of us have forgotten to pray. Mm -hmm. So when we place sort of like actions over prayer, that doesn't work. Everything we do must come from prayer. And, and oftentimes I wonder if, if the lion's share or many priests or bishops have really stopped praying. I, I'm, I'm sorry to be frank this way, but that's the only thing logically that makes sense. Once you stop receiving the Holy Spirit through a devoted prayer life, through going to Mary, through, through placing yourself at the foot of the monstrance and saying, please speak mm -hmm. to me, Lord. Once you do that, you begin to make compromises with the church and the world. So, so I always bring it back to that one word, prayer. Have we forgotten that prayer is essential? The root of everything we do as Catholics, as Christians. So that's that's where I am. I don't know if you've thought about that. Oh, no, no. Prayer is absolutely essential. I think the most important decision I ever made in my life was to surrender my life to the Lord on a retreat when I was a senior in college. But I think the second most important decision I ever made was take some time each day for personal prayer. But recently, I've had to add something uh, because I've met people who are devout, who pray, but don't have a clear head about what God's revealing to us about what's really going on in the world. And so I add to prayer, prayerful meditation on God's Word, you know, that we really need to be formed by the Word of God. We really need to take on the mind and heart of Christ. We really need to know what He says about sin. We need to know what He says about love. We need to know what He says about sexuality. We, we need to not only be devoted to the Lord, but be knowledgeable about what he's actually saying to us and being informed by it. So I'm I, I know I know what you're saying there. It's it's like I can pray. The Lord spoke to me in prayer, right? Because it, so, so you can you can myopically, yeah, you know, sort of customize. Um, we have this human tendency, this cocky human tendency, to sort of customize our prayer. But yeah. unless Ralph is, and you hit it, unless they know Scripture and understand, yeah. and, what the Lord, the, and what the church teaches, the church is faithfully carried on the apostolic understanding of what Jesus has taught us. And, you know, the Bible, the tradition of the church, catechism of the Catholic Church, we need to form our mind and heart on that, or we don't really know the real Jesus, and we can delude ourselves into a, a fake spirituality. There's a lot of fake spirituality going on. There's a lot of people writing books on spirituality that don't really believe the Jesus that's really revealed and kind of use his name. I, I'm with you. And again, I think it goes back to comfort. So. Prayers work. Let, let's make no mistake. Yeah. Prayers work. You carve it out and you say, God, I'm going to give you the next hour. Absolutely so, important. So I yeah. go back to comfort. Are we too comfortable to give God, who died on the cross yeah. very uncomfortably? Yeah. And I'll say it again. The, the centerpiece, I'd imagine, of my identity or a priest's identity would be Jesus Christ spread out on the cross, bleeding out. That was He was not comfortable doing that. No. <laughs> so, so if I'm going to reject prayer because I'm comfortable and I'd rather watch ESPN mm -hmm. or or put well, look yeah. at my cell phone, then then shame on me. Yeah. Shame on a priest. Shame on anyone who rejects prayer yeah. because he's just not. Eh, I'm not. I'm not motivated right now. But but that prayer with what you said, Ralph, and understanding of what Christ says in the scriptures, catechism, magisterium, the three legged stool tradition, then then we got a heartbeat chance to actually walk yeah. into the world with what how, how Christ intends us to. Yeah. I'm going to screw up, yeah. but, but at least I have a heartbeat's chance because I'm, I'm attentive to the Gospels, yeah. et cetera. Now, we haven't touched on this, and we only have a few minutes left, but you're, you're a married man, aren't you? Tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a Catholic man, husband, father. Tell us a little bit about your family. It's about time you asked. You saved me. My wife would have been upset with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm married to the beautiful Crystal Wells. Um, I was I was speaking to somebody back uh, a few minutes ago. She's she's a lover of horses. She's ridden horses for uh, mm. for her whole life. Um, I have three uh, wonderful children: um, Gabby, Sean, and Shannon, 22, 20, and, and 15. Um, I'm blessed. I mean, I'm blessed yeah. beyond all measure. Like, I really zero complaints in my life. I I'm, I'm a happy married man, dad. Um, I love what I'm doing for the Sisters of Mary. Yeah. I love to write. I, I I'm, I'm fortunate. I I do a good bit of writing. So it's uh, yeah. yeah, life's good. Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, if you had to say just one thing to people with us today, say it right to that camera over there. Just whatever you, what's on your heart that you just like to say to other people. Uh, so I, I would I would encourage uh, all the viewers to understand, and I, you, I imagine most of you do, um, that that we're in uh, uh, we're in dark times. A lot of people like would say that we're. The church is undergoing a crucifixion. I don't even see it that way. We haven't arrived yet. I, I often see us as leaving the upper room 
and walking to the garden. Like that's where we are. I, I believe that things are going to get uh, very dark. I, I'm not a doomsday guy. I'm, I'm actually a, a pretty joyful guy. Uh, but as we walk with Jesus to the garden in preparation for what what is happening, this crushing of truth, this crushing of 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 what we know to be true, we must be bold. We must be bold. And I know it's hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for me to proclaim my faith to those who are unbelievers. Um, but it doesn't matter anymore because the Holy Spirit, praise God, does the work for me. I don't, I don't do anything. I just try and cooperate the best I can. So what I would say, Ralph, to the viewer is um, you, you simply have to pray for fearlessness. Uh, we are now in this age of, I would say, 52 AD post-Pentecostal times. You're going to get mocked. You're going to get ostracized. You're going to lose friends. Family members will reject you. You're going to get crushed. But that doesn't matter because what, what matters is eternity. So I guess the one word I'll say, uh, pray for boldness, pray for fearlessness. If you're on that wall, you're helicoptering, you're straddling, no good. It's no good. You got to choose the right side. I don't care if the other side's growing in magnitude. Choose the smaller side, as Pope Benedict said. Choose the smaller side and, and be bold for Jesus Christ. Okay, well, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, again, your books, Priest and Beggar, about the tremendous work with children all over the world, and the other book, Priests We Need to Save the Church, and you can get those books on Amazon or anywhere you can get books. But I also like to tell you that we have a free booklet called What Must I Do to Be Saved by Pete Bork, one of our team members here at Renewal Ministries. And that's really the most fundamental question of all. You know, it's really a matter of salvation, being saved. What does that even mean? A lot of people don't even know what that we need to be saved from anything. Well, we need to be saved from darkness. We need to be saved from sin. We need to be saved from the power of the evil one. We most of all need to be saved from the penalty for sin, which is death. We need resurrection from the dead. It's only possible in Jesus. So we'd like to make this book booklet available to you at no cost just for the asking. Go to our website, renewal, renewalministries.net, and we'll be happy to send this booklet out to you right away. Jesus came to save us. All have sinned, and the wages of sin is death. Without his death and resurrection, we would have no hope of eternal life. In the scriptures, Jesus' teaching on the conditions of salvation is consistent, urgent, and pervasive. But we often gloss over these passages or fail to recognize the vitally important truth Jesus is revealing about whether or not we will go to heaven. In my new booklet, What Must I Do to Be Saved?, I unpack several of these important moments in the Gospels to help us understand what Jesus is saying so we can find and stay on the narrow path that leads to eternal life. To get your copy, visit our website or call the number on the screen.